Welcome to the Next Up Podcast. On this episode, I had the opportunity to sit lakeside with none other than the Dr. Katie Wilson in Wisconsin. In this episode, I also launched a new segment called Street Cred, which is our new way of introducing our guests, educating you on why they're worth listening to, and giving them the opportunity to toot their own horn and me the opportunity to celebrate their successes. I should have known that Katie's street cred session would take the entire episode due to her long list of accomplishments, ranging from her time at the ICN, creating a PhD program for school nutrition, being the USDA Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, and her current time as the Executive Director of the Urban School Food Alliance. So sit back, buckle up, and be prepared to be inspired. Dr. Katie Wilson, how are you doing? I feel like it's been um, a little bit since since I've seen you in person. It probably has, Marlon, because I wasn't going to a lot of the big national conferences this summer. I, I did miss you at our party. Uh, yeah, there <laughs> was a great party ignite. I heard about. Yes. It was a good time. It was <laughs> a good time. That. Uh, well, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for um, having your son open up his property to us to kind of hang out and do a podcast and catch up and talk about some cool things that you guys are doing. Um, it's gorgeous, Al, and great idea for having it outside. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, looking at the lake, when you're in, in Wisconsin, you have to enjoy some of the lakes that we have. Yeah, and I'm enjoying the weather, too, because where I come from in Florida, it is a lot more humid and hot than it is right now. So this is Perfect. Well, you're lucky because we hit 100 yesterday. What? So yes, sir. So this is a this is the break day we just really? got. Yeah. So you came in the perfect time. Okay. Well, thank you, God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was actually thinking. You know how I like to to do new things. Can we try something new right now? Okay, Marlon, I'm putting my <laughs> trust in you. <laughs> you can trust me. It's okay. Of course. All right. So I'm calling it street cred, right? So it's pretty much your time to toot your own horn and also introduce yourself to our audience. So we're pretty much setting you up as a subject matter expert, which we all know you are. So feel free to give us your backstory, how you got to where you are, and uh, let's get some street cred. Okay, Marlon, and I'm all for street cred because I really believe that it takes time in the field to make the things happen. And so I, I started out in seventh grade. We'll go that far back because back then I knew I wanted well, it's not to go that far. The... That's like what, like maybe like 20 years ago Oh, or yeah, so. maybe 20, yeah, not, not, not too far. Too far. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I knew I wanted to get into nutrition. It was something I was very passionate about. And I had a wonderful teacher that used to teach a class called home economics, which a lot of people don't know about anymore. But so I, I really knew that that was the trajectory. So I went to U the University of Wisconsin-Stout um, and it went into dietetics. But prior to that, I worked at a dairy store called Boy Blue. It was across from the Milwaukee County Zoo. It's kind of like a dairy queen. It no longer exists there. But I was the night manager by age 17. So food service is all I know. I tried babysitting. It didn't work so well. So I'm lucky my kids <laughs> turned out, right? So it, it turned out pretty good. <laughs> it was not my thing. So I started at Boy Blue. Then I went on to UW Stout. Went into dietetics. And in those days, you didn't have to do internships or things like that. But in the summer, I did it anyway. I went and I found jobs. One summer, I went to Superior, Wisconsin, where my roommate was from. And all I had was my bike and a tent. And I lived in my tent, and I rode my bike about four and a half miles every day and convinced the hospital to, to allow me to work there as a dietary aide in the kitchen. You literally lived in a tent. I did for a whole summer. Wow. And so, you know, I think maybe the last month of the summer, I got into the university dorms. But they were under repair, so I couldn't get in. And so I would ride my bike every day to the hospital at 5 in the morning, and I would work as a dietary aide. It, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience, and I was completely on my own. And, you know, that sort of, again, started me down this same track. Um, and then after graduating from the university, I went back home to Milwaukee, the Milwaukee area, had a degree in dietetics. And I got a job at St. Luke's Hospital in Milwaukee because I thought I was going to go and do my dietetic. It, we called it an AP4 program at that time. So I worked for a whole year, but I had a real problem in the hospital, and that is that I kept passing out. And so no matter what floor. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. <laughs> Marlon, no matter what floor, it was pediatrics, it was geriatrics, it was, you name it. Orthopedics was the worst. I cannot come and visit you if you're sick in the hospital, so please don't think I don't like you. I can't do it. When my children had their tonsils out, I passed out both times my husband happened to step out of the room, and I wake up in a bed, and they're like, mother down, mother <laughs> down, and it's me. Is it like a, like, what is it? Is it just blood? It's a, or just... it's a low blood pressure. It's a rush. I can't, I can't listen to 
take-home instructions on wound care. I can't do anything when it has to do with wounds. Okay. And so I kept passing out. I didn't know what I was going to do because in those days you just learned about clinical dietetics. I called back to the university, and my professor actually was a Dr. Wilson, Dr. Anita Wilson <laughs> at the time. And she said, come back, do administration. So I did. And I went back and did a master's degree. At the same time, I became a hall director. So I ran a large residence hall. I loved it. I absolutely loved that. Um, and then when I was done with my master's, I did a master's in food science and nutrition. And I decided, well, you know, I better go out and get a real job. And so I resigned from the university. But at that same time, two professors were going out on, on uh, medical leave in the dietetics department. So they asked me to stay one more year as a hall director and also teach. So I taught everything from basic nutrition to food photography. Uh, I love that too. I absolutely loved being in the classroom. And that's when I found out that I loved to teach, that instruction was my thing. And so I stayed a year and did that. And then finally went off on my own and, and met my husband, ended up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, because he was the new game warden in La Crosse. And I stayed home for a year because I had had a child and stayed home for the first year and thought, well, I really want to get back into the field. And so put my resume out everywhere. I, I didn't know what to do because I had been teaching at the university. I had worked in everything from supper clubs to fast food restaurants to Walgreens when they used to have restaurants. Wait, Walgreens had restaurants? Walgreens had a restaurant really? way back when, yes. Wow. And I had worked in that restaurant as a waitress and as a hostess. So food service was my background, but I didn't know where to go. I just happened to land a part-time job as the assistant director in the Onalaska Public Schools in school nutrition. I didn't. The only thing I knew about school nutrition is when I was doing my master's, I, I needed a thesis. And so they sent me up to the woman who was running the school nutrition program in Menominee, Wisconsin, where the University of Wisconsin Stout is. And they said, look, she's a registered dietitian. She's cutting edge. Go up there. Now, this is the early 80s. Go up there. She'll find a thesis for you. And I did, and I did the quality of a home pack lunch versus a school pack lunch. And in 1983, I bet, Marlon, you can decide what the results of that research was. I'm pretty sure the school meals were better than the home pack meals. Absolutely. Shocker. Even in 1983, <laughs> right? So uh, that's all I knew about school meals. But here I was getting a part-time job. I worked only school days, 8 to noon. It was perfect. And I made $6.25 an hour with a master's degree. You were killing it. <laughs> you know what? It's a, it fit perfectly. You look back now and you think, how did you ever do that? But I look back now and I think, look, first of all, I worked for a woman who was very, very passionate about school meals, taught me everything there was to know, insisted that I come to a local chapter meeting for the School Nutrition Association where I went to the restroom and literally came out as the uh, vice president of that, uh, that local chapter. <laughs> so when we say don't go to the restroom, <laughs> you'll be an officer, <laughs> we mean it. That's the truth. <laughs> uh, she was passionate about school lunch. Her name was Sue Black. I'll never, I'll, I'll, I, I, will, I will always be um, so honored to have worked for her. Taught me everything there was to know. Um, and then three years later, I went on to take on my own small district, West Salem, Wisconsin. 1,700 kids. A lot of people say to me, you were in a district of only 1,700 kids? Yeah, I was. And you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened because I knew how to wash dishes. I knew how to fix equipment. I knew how to hire employees. Mm -hmm. I did everything. Did all the jobs. You did every yeah. job because it was a small district. That was an interesting ride. I was in a small, that was a small rural community in Wisconsin. My husband was the new game warden in town, which was interesting in itself. <laughs> I bet. And here I came in, blowing into town. The person who had been running the program was also a head cook in one of the kitchens. I came in as an administrator, not a union member. I came in and I hired head cooks in all three kitchens, so I didn't cook. Mm -hmm. And that was, and I was the first woman on an all-male administrative team. That's interesting. It was interesting, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, and so the battles ensued, and it was a difficult ride. The first year I was there, the president of the union um, and the school board president decided they didn't need anybody with a master's degree around there. And so they did everything in their power uh, to, to get me out. They said, we'll get rid of her in a year, no problem. Everything from calling the health department nonstop about powder on the buns. Well, that's how buns come. There's flour on the bottom of the buns. Um, styrofoam trays on days where the dishwasher was down. 
we would stack them back in the box so the custodian could easily remove them. Well, they were telling people we were reusing those styrofoam trays. I mean, it was it was one thing after another after another. But I learned to play the game, and that was one of the best things. Um, I had an 82-year-old lady, Bev Repke, who was a dear friend of mine later on. She had worked there for years. And she came into my office one day, and I tell a lot of people this story. Because I came blowing in, young, full of ideas. I'm going to change the world, right? And she came into my office one day, and she said, you have an open-door policy, right? Oh, of course. That was the big buzzword of the time. (laughs) And she said, well, then, could I ask you something? I said, well, sure. What is it, Bev? When you come into a kitchen, when we're in a crisis situation, could you please just say hello first? Think of the power of that statement. Mm. The power of that statement. Somebody like me who's so type A, so goal-oriented, so many plans that I couldn't understand why people didn't want to do these things. We went from about a 35 participation, 35% participation rate in an open campus high school to 85%. All we did was put fresh fruit on the line. And they, they were never, trying to get rid of you still. They, they, well, that was beside the point, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so I, thank goodness, I held my tongue. And I sat back and I listened to Bev and I said, tell me more. And she talked about when I come into kitchens, they're in crisis in most cases, or I have a new idea. And I don't talk to them. I tell them. Just think of that. She had, and she would always say to me, Katie, I only have a sixth grade education, but I'm really a smart lady. And she was. That's a valuable feedback. Can you imagine the power? Just think of what it took her at age 82 to walk into that office and sit down and say that to me. Yeah. And I will be thankful to her to this very day. The rest of my career, I sent her a postcard from wherever I was. Mm-hmm. And when she passed away, her daughter gave me four box shoe boxes full of postcards that she treasured because we became very, very good friends. She taught me the best lesson I could have ever learned. Yeah. So talk about street cred. She had street cred. Yes, she did. I didn't. And so she taught me a very valuable lesson. So I went on in West Salem, and everything was a difficult challenge, but I learned a lot. First and foremost, how do you get your team on board? You've got great ideas, but if you can't get your team on board, forget it. Yeah. How do you value your team and not just yourself? Mm-hmm. How do you value what they bring to the table and not just your degrees, right? At the time I had a master's degree, I thought that was the Taj Mahal. It didn't matter to the team that had been working there for 25 years. Yeah. And everybody was telling them they were doing everything wrong, including me. So those were the things that were the best, most valuable lessons We wanted to get a breakfast program going into the district. The elementary school principal was completely against it. The bus drivers were completely against it. I had to learn to win at their own, at their game. So we applied for an award instead. And some of the other schools got the award. And and he wanted to know why other schools around me were getting these awards. Well, they have to have a breakfast program to get this USDA award. Well, don't you think we could have one? Of course we can. (laughs) And I let him have the TV news cameras, and he was the star of the show. But we got a breakfast program in the the district. Mm -hmm. And what I did to to keep the bus drivers happy is we invited them in. The first day of school every year, they got a complimentary breakfast. And we would make placemats that said, thank you for getting kids to school on time. We appreciate it. And we gave them a goodie bag to take home, plus they ate a school breakfast with the kids. Best way to show how good the breakfast program is, is to get them involved. Absolutely. All of a sudden, the breakfast program was the best thing that ever happened. (laughs) And they realized we never changed one bus schedule to make it happen. So that's another street cred, right? Learn your lessons, and sometimes the hard way. But you have to let them be the hero. You have to let them stand out front. That's fine that that principal took full credit for that. Good for him. We got a breakfast program in the, in, in the school district. Yeah, and the kids win. I tell you what, we went on to do some great things in West Salem. We started a line item in the budget for their training and professional development. Every one of them was certified by SNA, and they would put those, we framed those, hung them around the cafeteria. And so we let them be proud of who they were. They also got ServeSafe certified, but we paid them to get trained. They did not have to do this on their own time. It was a reward system to come to conference. And so we got them engaged as much as I was engaged. So then 
I began to really volunteer through the School Nutrition Association. That's where I learned a lot of my leadership skills because we were trained in leadership through the School Nutrition Association. And thank goodness the superintendent at the time, he realized that the skills I was bringing back to the district were as valuable as it was to have me gone for a few days. And again, I needed my team to carry on in a small district in particular because I was gone a lot. And so as things pursued and this, this uh, I became very good friends with the union because I believed in the union. My cooks were getting one paid holiday. Everybody else in the support staff union at the time was getting five. Why? Because my cooks weren't participating. So I really encouraged them to go participate in their own meetings and be a part of that. And they did. They became officers. They became, we, as programs grew, their numbers grew. So they got themselves more equalized in the program as well and in, within the union. And, and that was all good for everybody around us. Uh, so again, getting, making those partnerships, finding who the, the people are that will help the program grow. And the union was a real strong part of that for us because they encouraged those employees, come to work every day, do a good job, learn skills, go to training if it's offered to you. Those were things they were encouraging their, their members to do. So as we moved forward, things still kept happening with this, this president of the union at the time. And there were days that were very, very frustrating because I just didn't understand why people didn't like what we were doing. And we were bringing all kinds of credibility to the district. Yeah. And my superintendent at the time, Gene Ertz is his name, he also gave me a really good thing. One day he brought me into his office and I was very upset. And he said, Katie, put all the energy you have into your program. You have nothing to fight. Stop fighting those outsiders that don't want you to succeed. Put your energy into the program. It will sell itself. Within three years, we won a USDA national award on our junior chefs program. Wow. And that was before chefs come, moved to school was popular. Yeah. You know, so many of these things we talk about, <laughs> farm to school, chefs in school. There's a group of us in western Wisconsin that were very, very good friends, and we took really good care of ourselves. You and guys are so close you have a nickname for the group, right? We do. Yeah, we do. It's called the Yaya yeah Sisters. But I'll tell you, it was even people outside of that. Small districts five, five miles down the road, we helped them. We helped them write menus. We helped them order their USDA foods. We helped them with their training. We invited them to our training at the beginning of the school year every year because we were only as good as they were, right? Yeah. Their, their families all played sports together. So when they were standing at the baseball field, we wanted them to say good things about school meals, not trash one district and hope for the best in the next. And, and when young families came into the area, we wanted them to hear about school meals. Well, I was so excited and I got so involved at the national level then. My superintendent also became involved in his national association. Oh, wow. Which I was very excited about. Okay. And he'd come home from state meetings and even national meetings and he said, you know, as soon as I introduce myself as the superintendent of West Salem, I always get somebody to come up and say, well, do you, we know your food service director. He said, so we are literally on the map because of our school nutrition program. Yeah. I was very proud of that. <laughs> but it took a lot of work to get there. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of volunteer time. So many people say to me, how do you get to where you are? You volunteer. You say yes a lot. Put in the effort. You put in the time and the energy. I didn't get paid for a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so as I grew through the Wisconsin School Nutrition Association, and I eventually became president of the, that association, my whole mantra was inclusiveness. That also is nothing new, right? There's <laughs> yeah, been right. a lot of us that have been involved in that. <laughs> My number one thing when I was coming up through the ranks was, please don't all sit at a head table. There are a lot of people that are coming to your meetings for the very first time by themselves. Mm. You walk into a banquet room, Marlon, you've been there a hundred times in a hundred different states. They flip the chairs because they're saving them for your friends, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or you have the napkin over the back of the chair. Now I'm alone and I came to this state meeting the very first time by myself. And I walk into that banquet room, there's nothing more intimidating. Yeah. So I say to people, stop doing that. Mm -hmm. Bring them in. Watch people at the door, especially those of you that are in the inner circles. You know who those people are that have no one to sit with. Invite them to your table. Tell one of your popular friends to go sit at a different table. They'll survive it. Yeah. Bring them in. They'll come back another time. And so these are some of the lessons that we kept learning as we grow. And I'm going to say we because my team in my districts, 
my friends and colleagues. Best thing I ever did was sit down at a table for the first year directors because there were all small school nutrition directors at that table. And guess what? We were all going through the exact same thing. We were college educated. We came into small towns. They didn't really want us around. They didn't like that kind of change because they saw it as a threat mm -hmm. to what they had been doing. And because we found out that it wasn't us, it was the nature of the job. All of a sudden, it was worth doing. Because think of the kids we impacted in those yeah. small rural school districts. So when I hear over and over again, the small rural school district can't do it, oh, please. Been there, done that. Been there, <laughs> done that. The small rural school district, they couldn't afford not to hire me. I gave them a five-year plan and said, look, I don't like the salary you're offering, but if you give me this salary, I guarantee you I'll make it back within five years. Well, we made it back within a year. Nice. Because under food service management and learning food service management skills, we knew how to do things, and we knew how to manage that budget so that we could get that program rolling, and it began to generate its own revenue. With friends and colleagues in the field and being part of these volunteer organizations, I didn't know how to write a bid the first year I was in West Salem. I called my colleague in, on Alaska who taught me a lot about school nutrition. I called my colleague up in Eau Claire who had been doing it for a number of years and said, can I use your bid? <laughs> and the answer was, yes, of course you can. Yeah. So you have to learn. You have to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Be willing to learn something new all the time. And say hello when you walk in that kitchen door. Because that in itself is the street, street cred you need to keep moving forward. And then to just keep saying yes. Yeah. Uh, from West Salem, I did that for 18 years. Went to Middleton right near here. We're in Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Middleton is a suburb of Madison, Wisconsin. They needed somebody because I had a director in a couple of years. And so about 10,000 students. And so I came down here for a year uh, and, and worked and tried to put it, used everything I had learned to put together a program. And then within a year, the director who had originally trained me in Onalaska, Wisconsin, was retiring. And she called me up and she said, hey, I know your family's still here. Come on back home. Onalaska would love to have you back. That's awesome. Street cred, yeah. right? That's not burning a bridge. That's doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. Keep working with people. Keep sharing what you know. And I went back almost 20 years. I think it was 20 years to the day when they hired me as their assistant director in a brand new position that they had just created, I went back as their director. Wow. So it's been a wonderful ride. Um, by that time, I was well on my way to a PhD. Mm -hmm. I decided I got tired of even going to Congress and testifying at Congress, being patted on the head as a school lunch lady. Yeah. I don't like the term. I will never like the term. We won't, I'm well aware. <laughs> we won't move this dial if we don't stop doing that to ourselves. Yeah. I'm a professional in this field, and so went back and said to a couple of different professors that I knew, and Dr. Jeannie Sneed was one of them. She had been involved in school nutrition for a very long time. And I said, Dr. Sneed, she was at Iowa State at the time, and I said, we need more people with PhDs. We need to be able to get PhDs. I want to sit at, in Congress, in front of Congress, and testify as Dr. Katie Wilson. The PhDs I had looked at would ask me to move somewhere away from my family for long periods of time. I couldn't do that, and I couldn't quit my job. So she went to Iowa State, and together we crafted the Child Nutrition Academy. I love that. At Iowa State. And it was a Ph.D. program that Iowa State agreed to, thanks to Dr. Sneed. And they said, okay, come to campus three weeks for two summers in a row, nine credits in three weeks, every hour in the classroom and every paper that had to be written, no shortcuts, but they gave us in-state tuition for everything from our master's degree, no matter how old it was or what topic it was in, as long as you had a B or better. Wow. That was huge when you think about it. Yeah, that's massive. So first summer, I, and no money for recruitment. So guess what, Katie? Go recruit 18 people. <laughs> I needed 12 people to start the Ph.D. program at Iowa State. Mm -hmm. We recruited 18 from across this country. Mary Kate Harrison and some was which I know. one of our buddies. <laughs> she was there with us. We moved into a sorority house together. <laughs> I bet you guys were a bunch of fun. <laughs> they were three guys on the top floor, yeah. and the rest of us were on the bottom two floors. It was 
hilarious. Oh, that's great. We about died. <laughs> we about killed each other. We about killed the professors. Because yeah. if they wanted us to write five papers at night, we wanted them back the next day. Right? Yeah. Come summer two, number two, we figured out how to do this better. They gave us research and writing to do prior to campus, after campus. But so many of us went on to do bigger and better things in the field of child nutrition with yeah. our PhDs from that program. And, and it was great because we just forged ahead. As crazy of an idea as it was, we forged ahead. That program not only gave, brought me new friends from around the country in the field, brought me to the next adventure in my life, and that was, the at the time, the National Food Service Management Institute. It was down at Ole Miss at the University of Mississippi, and they were looking for someone. USDA funds that completely, and USDA was really looking for someone to completely change the trajectory of mm -hmm. that organization mm -hmm. and make it the national organization it needed to be. And so I applied, but you needed a Ph.D. to do that. But you had one. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was packing my bags, and my husband said, we're moving where? <laughs> uh, 2010, I had been in on Alaska three years as their director, and I decided to move on. Um, again, risk, risk-taking. Street, street cred means risk-taking, right? Yeah. You've got to take some risks. He always said to me, look, if you wait till both the boys get out of high school, then I'll go anywhere with you. Because being a game warden in Wisconsin is a very prestigious position, and there are only about 138 of them. Mm. And so that took him some work um, to get there. And so he did, and he was proud of who he was. And, and so he said, look, if you just wait until the last one, you know, till our second son graduates from high school, I'll go anywhere. Well, Jim's diploma was still, the ink was still drying. <laughs> and I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> and away we went. So he stayed back. Uh, we still have property in Wisconsin. He kind of lived back and forth. I went to Mississippi, and we ended up making that a national institute, changing its name to the Institute of Child Nutrition, uh, really changing the trajectory of that. We started the Chef's Move to School program. We got involved with Michelle Obama when she was the first lady and the Healthy Kids, um, you know, all of the different initiatives she did, the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act. And we did a lot of things for the USDA that they can't do because of bureaucracy, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was there four and a half years, almost five. And then you got a phone call, right? And then I got a phone call. And Marlon, <laughs> I'll never forget the phone call as long as I live. Because in the meantime, I'm speaking all over, and I love to speak at national conferences and state conferences and really empower these people because I knew what it was to be at the bottom level. I knew what it was like to be there. And I, I will always be thankful for the lessons learned in West Salem, small rural school district where no one really brought them along. By the time I left West Salem, there's an airplane flying by. Yeah. <laughs> By the time I left West Salem, they were being invited to the district strategic planning committee meetings because they were now an integral part of the district. And that's what we wanted to do. That's where we wanted to get to, right? And so I had learned all of these things, and I really wanted to empower people. And I was in Alaska doing, working at the... Um, teaching at their state conference, doing some breakout sessions. And what was that conference like? That's fabulous. It's in January every year. I'm going again in 2024. Okay. I'm going back. You, <laughs> you need to have an experience, Marla. I would love to go. <laughs> January in Alaska. Tanya is the chair. Um, the, talk about passionate people that yeah. go through all hardships. Mm -hmm. And now the noon whistle. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we are back after the uh, the noon bell, you called it? Or the noon, noon whistle. Horn? Noon, yeah. noon whistle. Right. The <laughs> all noon right. whistle. All right. <laughs> So, Marlon, I was in Alaska at their wonderful uh, state conference, SNA, mm -hmm. School Nutrition Association Conference, and I had taken a break, and I'll never forget the moment it happened. I'm in, the, and I'm in a museum, and I'm looking around, and I get a phone call, and it looks like it's from Washington, D.C. Now, I had a very good relationship with USDA, so I picked it up because we were always doing something at the Institute for them. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, hello, is this Dr. Wilson? Yes. Well, this is the presidential personnel office from the White House. Okay, really? Who are you? <laughs> I, I mean, I was like, who's messing with me? Punked. Yes, I thought I was getting messed with. Yeah. And so um, I said, okay, really? Like, what's your name? And she gives me her name. And then she said, no, really, that's who we are. She said, um, the president is interested in, in having you serve as the deputy undersecretary for the United States Department of Agriculture, Food, Nutrition, Services. Would you be interested in having a conversation about that? 
I about passed out cold. <laughs> uh, you know, here I am, the food service director from West Salem, Wisconsin, right? Mm -hmm. 1,700 kids is where I started my yeah. career. And they're calling me to be deputy undersecretary. I had not joined a political party. It was the final two years of the Obama administration. Dr. Janie Thornton, one of my dear, dear friends, um, had been the deputy undersecretary. She was also one of our PhD colleagues, uh, part of that program. And so she was leaving, and they had two years left in the administration. And so they said, we are really looking for someone with your expertise, with your level of knowledge. And would you be willing to come in and speak to us? And I said, um, uh, uh, sh uh, sure. Uh, I'm in Alaska right now. And so they set up a meeting, and I flew to D.C., and I went through a series of meetings. And the next thing I know, I was offered the position, and I thought, why not? And away I went. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I, I got an apartment right where Dr. Thornton had her apartment uh, when she was there, just because I really didn't know the area yeah. very well. I mean, I knew D.C. from going there, but not mm -hmm. to live there. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, well, guess what? Here's the next adventure. And he just shook my head, his head, and he said, you're kidding. D.C.? He said, look, I could handle Mississippi because we did get a house there, and he yeah. kind of lived in between. He said, but D.C., probably not my gig. This is a retired game warden now. Yeah. He had retired mm -hmm. in 2010. So we went there, and I got moved in. And I'll, the, one of the first days I was on the job, and he was visiting the office and meeting Kevin Kincan and the undersecretary and everybody in the office. And the chief of staff came in. My chief of staff came in and said, oh, Dr. Wilson, they're going to have a huge flyover on the National Mall because our offices are in the USDA building right across from the National Monument. So I'm on the National Mall every day in the building that Abraham Lincoln built during his term of well. office. So they said, we're going to have this big World War II flyover. You and your husband should go out there with your lunch or go to the food truck and enjoy it. We went out there. We had a blanket. I had packed a lunch because I was going to show them the mall. We were going to go out on the mall anyway. And we went out there. And Marlon, there was a million people that came for this flyover. And after lunch, I looked up and I, I looked around and I said to him, wow, look, here we are in Washington, D.C., with a million people from all over the world around us. Isn't this magnificent? And he looked at me and he said, sure, yeah, for some. <laughs> and, and he, now remember, he's a game warden, yeah, right? He's yeah. used to being in the woods by himself or, uh, you know, doing his own thing. Well, to make matters worse, when he flew home that weekend, one of those planes broke down at Reagan oh, National, no. and he was delayed seven or eight hours oh, in the great. airport. <laughs> so needless to say, he came to visit once in a while. We were invited to the Christmas decorations, the politicals. I mean, what an experience that was. I had a car and a driver. Only I got out of the car half the time in, in traffic because I could walk faster. <laughs> and they would say, oh, Dr. Wilson, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, I also treated the drivers with respect because there were some people there that didn't. Mm. And you really needed them. Yeah. And they knew D.C. Mm -hmm. And so I treated them with respect. Well, one of the times the driver needed to take me to the Korean, South Korean embassy for a, a social. And they really wanted me to go because they wanted you know me to show up there and get, sign into the book. There were a lot of protocols you went through. Mm -hmm. Well, I was to be there till 9.30 at night, and I knew that he had a birthday party in his family, and I said, no, please, go home. I will get home. This is before you knew how to use Uber and Lyft and all this. Yeah. I thought, you're in D.C. It's pretty easy. Get a cab. Mm -hmm. Well, he did not like that idea, but I finally convinced him to go home. Don't sit till 9.30 at night to drive me home. I got out of the South Korean embassy, Marlon, and you were in the middle of nowhere, and there's no cab, <laughs> and there was no Uber or Lyft on my phone. And I must have walked three or four miles at 930 at night having absolutely no idea where I was. And I thought, <laughs> he will kill me if he finds out what happened Don't to me. Don't tell him what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I must have walked two or three miles before I could even any, get anywhere near a cab. Wow. Um, and so, you know, you begin to learn your lessons and figure out what's <laughs> what you can and cannot do. But that was an experience of a lifetime. I met so many wonderful people doing really fabulous work, um, really found out how passionate the food nutrition career staff are. Because mm -hmm. I was one of those people, too, that would get really frustrated with new regulations. But they're just doing what the political appointees tell them what to, uh, what to do. Yeah. And they're trying to do it in the best way possible. 
Um, so, but I, I, every time I walked up those steps, every single day, because I was in the old part of the building, uh, and the marble steps were grooved from all the people that had walked up those same steps. And I thought to myself, how did I get here? Why do I get this honor to help make these kinds of decisions and help guide this kind of work? And I was absolutely honored to work with the First Lady in all of her initiatives, um, Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, the Chef's Move to School Initiative. Uh, she really cared. Mm -hmm. This was something she really cared about. It wasn't just a platform. Yeah. Uh, you'd go into her office, and she would have a bowl of fresh apples, and you'd sit and you'd cross your legs on the couch, and you'd be as casual and comfortable as possible, and she'd say, all right, now let's get down to work. We have a lot to accomplish. And you would. She really wanted to accomplish things. And she wanted to put them into programs that were sustainable. Not mm -hmm. a one and done, I got my name on this. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do, folks, that's going to change the nutrition quality of what the kids are getting at school on a permanent basis? So that 30 years from now, when we're all gone, they're still moving forward. She also knew it wasn't the end point. And so absolutely honored. We did get invited to the Christmas decorations in a special invite, so my husband would come for those. Yeah. Fourth of July, we'd have Fourth of July on the top of the USDA building. And then I have a, my mother's cousin was the president of the National Press Club in D.C. because he was the White House correspondent for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for many, many years. And so he invited us to the Gridiron Dinner. What was that like? That was the most amazing experience. I was sitting with everybody from ABC, all the ABC news anchors, and we were sitting at the same table. Um, I met Madeline Albrecht and chatted with her and had my picture taken with her. I talked to Lester Holt and had cocktails with him. I mean, it was just amazing. The Bidens were there. Um, what an experience that was. Black tie. I looked at my husband, and I said, you really want to do this with me, don't you? And he kind of looked at me, and I said, well, you have to get a tux. Now, I have a son that's a mechanical engineer here in Madison, mm -hmm. and I have another son that owns his own logging and forestry business in northern Wisconsin. And he looked at him, and he said, say what? <laughs> Dad, no way. You're going to be a penguin? <laughs> You're going to look like a penguin. I said, be quiet. Go <laughs> away. Up, son. <laughs> you, your father's getting in a tux. Yeah. Uh, the son who got married, and we all wore cowboy boots you know, awesome. under our gowns <laughs> at this beautiful wedding. But, yes, he came. It was absolutely a wonderful experience. We loved it. But every memory, uh, I, I'll never forget leaving January 17th um, when the when Trump, uh, Mr. Trump won the election. Mm -hmm. And then politicals just move out. It, it, there's yeah. no difference there. Every political party does that. As soon as there's a new president, even if it's the same political party, Sometimes they have their own people, and they move them out. So by January 17th at noon, your credentials no longer work on the security on the door. And everything you have to have everything cleared out of your office. Marla and I literally walked around Washington, D.C. with tears streaming down my face thinking, mm -hmm. this is my city. This is my town. I want to do more here. Uh, and so that was an end of that era. Um, to, go, to, to do that kind of work, but the kind of people you met – when they took you at USDA, they took you all over everywhere. As this was all happening, and I became president of the School Nutrition Association back in 2008, I kept meeting people. In 2008 or 2009, when I was president of SNA at our meeting in Las Vegas, this young woman walks up to me and introduces herself as Lindsey Graham. Not the Lindsey Graham that we know in, <laughs> as a senator in the U.S., but as Lindsey Graham from Scotland. She was working in school nutrition in Scotland. And as, a, as an advocate, uh, not necessarily in a district, but as a health advocate. Well, I became very good friends with her. So I then became very engaged in school nutrition work in the U.K. And so um, helped. I, I've talked to Parliament, both in Scotland and in, in England. I've met in the mayor's office of London. Um, we hel I've helped them. She w became a Winston Churchill Fellow. So I helped her. One summer we went to nine different states and looked at breakfast programs. And then she went back and we helped begin breakfast clubs in the UK. Uh, summer meals, they call it holiday provision. We helped start all that back in the, over in the UK. So it, it can take you very many places. When I was president of the School Nutrition Association, we were invited to speak at the International Dietetics Conference in Japan. 
So um, off I went to Japan with Barbara Belmont, the executive director at the time. What was school meals like in Japan? That's absolutely phenomenal, all very home-cooked, but students were engaged in the cooking and the serving and the cleanup. They learned food safety. They learned how to put a meal together. Uh, so students were all very engaged. It wasn't as separated as it is now, yeah. and it was part of the curriculum. You know, the U.K. went through the same thing we did with healthy nutrition standards, only they did it 10 years prior to us. And everybody pushed back, pushed back. Oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. Industry can't make this. They can't make that. So England kind of backed off, but Scotland stayed the course. 14 years later, England came back with even stronger nutrition standards, and students have to have a culinary training class in school from age 7 to 14 every single year. Wow. So they learn how to prepare food and where food comes from. Scotland has statistics to show health-wise because they stayed the course. Yes, kids got used to it. Yes, kids accepted the meals. And now they have better better health outcomes, everything from dental to weight um, to coming to school with attendance, Mm -hmm. all of that, uh, because they didn't didn't back off. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, people do the same things. We're all experiencing the same thing. Through this, I met Robin Gurley, who was, um, at the time was a minister in the Scottish government, and he oversaw all food and beverage policy in Scotland. Um, Backtrack a little bit to the Institute. I had the very first major city meeting via what we didn't know was called Zoom, but it was via (laughs) Skype. Yeah. And we met with some of the major city directors in Scotland who were already doing carbon footprints, uh, farm to school, local procurement, scratch cooking. They were already doing all of that uh, back in 2010. And so I met Robin, um, who helped me set that up. He then later got me involved in a group called Eating City. Hmm. EatingCity.org is an international group funded by a foundation in France and Italy uh, that brings young people together every year to an organic farm outside of Paris. They're actually there right now, uh, and I'm missing it this year because I'm expecting my third grandchild (laughs) any hour. (laughs) When the phone rings, that's it. Um, So I couldn't go this year. But we bring these young people from all over the world to this organic farm for a week for for a summer campus. And they have guest lectures from all over about sustainable food systems, organic food systems. What do you do within your own realm to begin to change the food system? And then they write a declaration. And every year they have this declaration of what they as a group come collectively come together to believe in and what they're going to do. Well, I'm now on the board of directors of Eating City. Wow. And that took me to Valencia, Spain, because the International Council of Mayors was meeting, and they wanted a speaker to talk about the declaration that these students were doing. So you see, school nutrition can take you everywhere. It can, apparently. <laughs> and then the, the Global Child Nutrition Foundation, I still stayed actively involved in that, even after it left SNA and separated itself. Mm-hmm. So I've been in South Africa with the Global Child Nutrition Foundation. I've also been in Brazil with the Global foundation. Um, and, and again, I learned, talk about street cred. What we learned with the Global Child Nutrition Foundation, at first when we started it with SNA, we thought we were doing good, right? And we would bring all these people from all these developing countries to the U.S. Well, you and I know what SNA looks like. The amount of food, mm-hmm. the banquets, the food show. It was just more than what some of these people could even process. Mm-hmm. So we learned very quickly that that wasn't the best way. And so what we did there is then we, the Global Child Nutrition Foundation learned that we need to go there. And we need to talk about them developing their own policy in school nutrition because we're very unique mm-hmm. in having the kind of federal policy we have to make sure that all children get fed. And so by allowing them and creating templates for them to create their own federal policy, and then they began to get agricultural, um, also agricultural groups involved. So farm to school, small villages growing their own food for schools. All of that then turned into this. And Arlene Mitchell is now the CEO. Um, and our dear, our dear, dear colleague, Jean White, who passed away a few years ago, really founded that organization and really made that organization grow. Um, Arlene Mitchell is still the CEO, is still the executive director there. And I just had dinner with her in D.C. not too long ago. They're doing fabulous work where these governments are actually choosing 
to write policy to feed children in schools. Wow. Marlon, that's full circle. That is full circle. But there is still so much more to your story, too, isn't there? There's a bit more. <laughs> there's, yes. there's definitely what some more. What's going on? <laughs> well, you know, we after the ed- administration, what do you do? You yeah. hope you get a job. Um, I didn't find anything I liked. There, are, I thought my passion would be strong, so I started consulting. Mm-hmm. And then in 2019, the Urban School Nutrition, the Urban School, I gotta say it right, <laughs> the Urban School Food Alliance, who had started in 2012 as all volunteers from the largest districts in the country, contacted me, and I had worked with them along the way. Mm-hmm. giving them advice and, and talking to them. And we're all colleagues in school nutrition. So they said, hey, look, we're ready for a executive director. We're ready for paid staff. Would you be willing to help us build this organization? And after a couple of calls, I said, okay, all right. So real I quick, I have to ask you, because I meant to ask you earlier, what was, what was the uh, interview process like for the USDA was it more like interviews or was it meetings? And was the interview process for Urban School Food Alliance more challenging? The Urban School Food Alliance was much more stressful, let me tell <laughs> <Really>? you. <laughs> because you had all of these directors from all these big districts that I had very much respect for mm-hmm. around the table. Mm. And I'm trying to convince them from not ever working in a district that size that I'm the person they want to hire to be their new, very first executive director. Yeah, I had to fly to New York to do it. I had to meet, find this building in New York and this office <laughs> space in New York, so I was lost. Um, yeah, USDA was very casual. It was wonderful. Kevin Kincannon, you can't work for a better person in your in your life. Yeah. He and a number of people in the office, the chief of staff, they were all there to talk to you. Then a, a conversation with the secretary. Um, so that was pretty casual. Okay. I, I think they probably had that already figured out yeah. Uh, because they really told me they hired me for my expertise. Kevin was SNAP, um, the food stamps program, mm-hmm. WIC, food banks. That was Kevin's specialty in his career. And, of course, food service, school nutrition was mine. Yeah. And so they really – and they had had such success with Dr. Thornton and all the knowledge she brought because her background was school nutrition. Yeah. So it was a great partnership. <clears throat> um, so that was a little more casual. Okay. Um, but, no, the Urban School Food Alliance, talk about intimidating – when I'm with them on a food show, I can have a lot of fun with them or in a focus group. And I have a couple of times I have told them from little West Salem, Wisconsin, yeah. be quiet over there. <laughs> you don't know it all, right? Because we were good friends. Yeah. And they're like, you said that to the director in Dallas? Yeah, well, he can sit <laughs> down, you know. And here now he was the chair yeah. of the alliance. Yeah. Right? So, He's a great sport. Yeah. Great oh, sport. yeah. Really, you know, good people. <laughs> yes, they have to play their role sometimes because they are who they are. Yeah. And they run these massive programs, and the challenges are massive. Mm-hmm. But they're so every one of them is more passionate than the next, yeah. and they care very deeply, or they wouldn't stay in the jobs they're in because industry would scoop them up in a heartbeat every Absolutely. single one of them. Mm-hmm. So it's been my journey since 2019 with the alliance. We went from 10 districts at the time to now 18 districts. We're having a ball. It's been a, a long journey. We're we're trying to figure out where's our best fit. Yeah. What can we do to change this system mm-hmm. so that all kids get really good food in their school systems? Uh, that we change the food system itself. Because I'll stand in front of a school nutrition person any day. Yeah. And like I said, we put salad bars in in the early 80s. I, yeah. I don't know what this all is about salad bars. Because <laughs> in the early 80s, I put one into West Salem schools, and they had all-you-can-eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. That's how we raised our participation rates, right? So um, they're doing the best they can with the resources they have and the expectations of their district. Mm. Because some of it does have to do with their local expectation. Mm -hmm. If the status quo is okay, it's okay. If it's not, then we need to do something to change it. And I'll close with this. I've met with the director here in Madison, a, a brilliant guy who's relatively new, not to the field of child nutrition, but to Madison. Mm -hmm. And he says, Katie, I want to change the system because the food is accepted, but not acceptable. I like that. Think of that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I I should have known that for me, me asking you to give me your street cred would turn into the entire podcast because (laughs) your list is so long, which is why I love hanging out with you and speaking with you, just being around you. Because you just have so much knowledge and wisdom. And the more I hang out with you, the more I realize how much of a disruptor and how innovative you are. And I kind of feel like that's why we connect. Um, 
and this isn't the uh, this isn't the end of what you're doing or our podcast series because there's a lot to dig into as far as how you guys are innovating with Urban School Food Lines and what you guys are doing to really solve problems and make school nutrition better as a whole, not just for your 18 districts, but for the entire country and even you mentioned the world. So thank you so Welcome. much. Yeah. for taking the time to hang out with me today. You're welcome. And we will talk again okay. real soon. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. Thanks, Marlon. Glad right. to be here. Thank you.